through my years of going to church and ministry, and I ran to several people who, through different situations, have left the church because of maybe of a bitter attitude or of a, uh, something that didn't go their way or something they have heard. And I have dealt and talked with some of these. In fact, some of them are my friends. And they'll say, I've heard some say that um, the church is full of hypocrites. Uh, how can I worship with someone like that? I've heard that one. Um, I've heard some say that I've been an adult Sunday school teacher for a long time, and I get no help from the staff, and it seems like everyone else has their own agenda, so I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then I've heard, I, in fact, I, I know of a pastor recently that was on staff that quit because he said this, and I quote, the modern church nowadays is broken. It needs to be fixed, and the way we are doing it now is not working. And so he quit the church, and he quit being on staff. And, you know, there are just some examples. I'm pretty sure there's a lot more that come to our mind, and I could probably bore you to death with a lot more stories. But we get the picture. Maybe you yourself have uh, thought or have said the same thing. Maybe you have thought the church is broken. Or why does the church do things this way? Or why do they do things a certain way that way? Or... How come some churches do it this way and others do it differently and who's right and who is wrong? Maybe we come to church with some presuppositions from earlier churches, from the way we grew up, and many people base what a church should be based upon how they were taught and how they grown up. If you came from a very conservative background like maybe myself, we immediately say, church is not a church unless we use this version of Scripture. Or church is not a church unless we have a piano and an organ. Or church is not a church unless we have this program or that program. Or church is not a church unless we play only Hillsong music. Or church is not a church unless you fill in the blank. And we come as adults and as we, we come to different churches with all these presuppositions of what church should be. And we grew up that way, and it was ingrained into us. And so we fight, and we bicker, and we want to have it our way, because our presuppositions is declaring that this church, the way it's doing it, is incorrect. Our way is the correct way. That way we need to fight. We need to bicker. We need to become divisive. We need to split. Because I need to show it my way. An example from Scripture, if I could hammer this home a little bit further, is from the church of Corinth. If you remember, Paul was writing to this messed up church. And he was correcting them, he was encouraging them, he was mainly rebuking them for the mishandling of the church. And over in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 10, it says this, and let me read this passage. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no division among you, but you, that you have made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed, here is Paul saying, he said, I've heard. I have heard some stuff. I have been informed concerning you by my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. There are some fightings. There are some bickerings. There's some division among you. And this is what he says. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of, of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did not baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptize any other. For here it is, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be voided. Here's the kicker. Verse 18. Listen to this. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I'll set aside, meaning this. Y'all missed the message. You missed the message. You missed the function of the church. 
you got so divisive, you got so wrapped up in the way it should be and the programs that not to be, and you got so tied up on your presuppositions that you just missed the whole message. And then Paul lays out in the rest of 1 Corinthians what that message is. He says, let me explain to you. And there's, there's another message we could have gone into. But he says, you're all being misled by prominent figures and leaders. You're being misled by agendas, ideas, and cultural changes. You're all being so caught up in all that that you missed it. But not only have you missed the message completely, but you missed functioning as a church. So, this morning, I'm going to be starting a sermon series on the anatomy of the church. Uh, the structure of the church. And as I continue to keep studying for this message, or for the series, I guess you can say, it keeps growing. It's becoming quite a beast so far. So I really don't know how long this is going to take, how many sermons it's going to be. It's going to be quite a while. I'll try and cut it off before the first of the year. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to be looking at the anatomy of the church. And this morning, I'd like to take you to a couple of different passages. And I'm just going to try and stay pretty basic for a little while. And then we're going to start getting into how the church, church looks like, what it's based on, and then how it's all functioning. I'm going to go on through all of that. But this morning, it's going to be pretty basic. Uh, there are several passages of Scripture that we're going to get this from. Today, we're going to see the church needs to recognize two non-negotiables. We cannot, we cannot fight over this. It's non-negotiable in order to be called a church. Two non-negotiables, and here's the timeless truth. Here's the purpose, all right? Here it is, Clear Creek. A true church recognizes that complete, inerrant, infallible authority of Scripture. We need to recognize that this morning. The complete, inerrant, infallible authority of Scripture. Inerrant and infallible may basically meaning without error. Without error. This should cause us to look to Scripture for all guidance. Here's our motivation. It should cause us to look to Scripture for all guidance. Here's the motivation. It should cause us as a church to look to the scripture for guidance in building a church. That's our motivation this morning. Set up a little background, get a little bit further into this. 1 Timothy 3.15 says this, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you'll know one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of truth, of the truth. Paul's writing to young Timothy in this letter He's encouraging Timothy and the expectations of the church and its leaders. And Paul was evidently looking, about, looking and, and thinking about the local church when he wrote this, this, this passage here in 1 Timothy. And it's kind of, if you look at that word, he mentions two, two words that stick out in me. One is the household of God and the other one is a pedestal. When Paul mentions household, he's referring to the local church as being a family. And in fact, later on in chapter 5, he calls them brothers and sisters. You're all of God, you're brothers and sisters. So he starts using some family terminology. So as a church, you're a family. You're a family. And then he says, so the church there would be conduct corporate life as a family, not a business, not as a country club, not as an entertainment center, not as a fuzzy club, not any other organization. The second word there is uh, in 1 Timothy is pillar or pedestal, a support, the foundation, what holds everything up. And if you look at the end of the verse, it says right there what is holding the church up, the family, the truth, the scriptures. It says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth, the truth, the scriptures. That is the support. Well, guess what? All that was my intro. So with all those thoughts in our mind, and let me get into 2 Timothy 3.16, if you want to go over to 2 Timothy 3.16, we're going to be bouncing around a lot. Just get your pen ready to just write down a lot of passages. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 is going to be my launching verse. I'm going to look at these two non-negotiables in order to be called a church. Roman numeral number one, you're going to see that it's a non-negotiable to ignore the authority of Scripture. That's non-negotiable. It is non-negotiable to ignore the authority of Scripture. Even though these two men uh, were on the opposite side of theology and, and, and doctrines, uh, they both agreed on what constituted to, be, constituted to be a true church. Luther and Calvin defined the church, and they actually both agreed on the definition of it. John Calvin actually said this. He says, 
wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. The church needs to be founded upon solid, expository preaching. That is a must. Preaching the word of God, preaching of the scriptures has to be first and primary responsibility of the church. Both, but the question that actually needs to be asked here is, how can we be sure that the scripture is the ultimate source of truth and guidance? How do we know that there is nothing else, scriptures plus something else? How do we not know that maybe some is correct, some is maybe to be debated? How, do we, can, how can we actually take comfort in resting solely upon the authority of Scripture? Well, as you turn to 3.16 there, if you're there already, it says this, and we know this verse very well, but let me pick it apart, okay? Let me pick it apart. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The word here that we see for Scripture as you say there, all scripture is the Greek word graphe, meaning to write or a thing written. A document is what it's called. It is needed to be known that the majority of the New Testament uh, uses the word graphe, and it typically refers to the Old Testament. So when they say graphe, they're typically talking about what was written in the Old Testament. Since what they are right now was the New Testament, a lot of their writings was about the Old Testament. Graphe was used sometimes in the plural, uh, like in Matthew 21, 42. These are some supporting verses. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, did you ever read in the scriptures? And Matthew 22, 29, again, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. Uh, John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that you have eternal life in them. Or in Acts 17, 11, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures, plural, daily, to see what these words are so. And there's a whole bunch more that we can go through, of course, and, and, and look at the plural of that word, graphe. Of course, though, there's another, word, another way that this word is used. It's also used in the singular. And the singular form is understood to be the same as quoting God. For an example, another supporting verse in Romans 11, 2 says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you know that the scripture, singular, says in the passage about Elijah? Or in James 2, 8, if, you, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So there it is in the singular. A lot of it is to be understood as quoting the same as God. Well, all this is well and good, and no, you're like, all right, that's the grammatical form of it. Thank you for breaking down that word. But the question needs to arise in our minds. You're like, did not human writers pin these words? Didn't they inscribe these words? Aren't they the one that picked up the quill and wrote these words down? Yes, humans did. That is correct. But it says there in our verse, all scripture is inspired by God, meaning God breathed. 2 Peter 2, uh, let's see, no, 2 Peter 1, 21. 2 Peter 1, 21, here's one that you can put down in your bank and write and go back to. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In the Old Testament alone, the human writers refer to their writings, to their writings as words of God over 3,800 times. To drive this doctrine, this is the doctrine of the inspiration of scriptures, by the way. To drive this home a little bit further, if you remember Satan and the Garden of Eden, remember when uh, Satan was uh, uh, going up to Eve, tempting Eve, and in Genesis 3, 1, Satan said, Indeed, has God not said? And he said, Has God not said this? And then over in verse 3, Eve replies, Yes, God has said this. Moses is the one who wrote Genesis, but God is the author. God breathed it. 
Jesus reaffirms, uh, if we can get another scriptural example of this, Jesus uh, reaffirms that the Spirit spoke through David. In Matthew 11, 20, or 12, 36, uh, he's actually quoting from Psalm 110. But he says, David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put thy enemies beneath my feet. The author of Hebrews directly attributes Scripture to the Spirit of God in Hebrews 3, 7. says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you heard his voice. So clear, clearly, the Spirit of God used men of God to write the Word of God is what we can come down to. One other little area to, that we need to understand, and I don't believe I quite covered this yet. You might be asking, okay, it's good about the Old Testament. You kind of cleaned up the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? What about the New Testament? Our verse here says all Scripture, meaning the complete, the whole Scripture. It is also important to note that if you were to study the, the, the similar Greek constructions in other parts of the New Testament, it, it argues strongly from a grammatical support and perspective that all Scripture is inspired is actually the proper translation. Meaning this, Scripture is revelation conveyed. Inspiration is the means of that conveyance. In other words, originally revealed and recorded, all Scripture is God's inherent word. I know that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a kind of a tough doctrine to, to wrap around, and, and um, there's a lot more moving parts to that as well. It'd be great to sit down and, and go through that study one of these days on the doctrine of the inspiration of scriptures, but that's kind of the gist of it, and that's kind of the springboard that will launch us into that. Daniel Fuller says in his journal, communication be, can be an error only if it fails to live up to the intention of its author. If they fulfill this intention, we regard them as an errant. A liberal preacher once went up to D.L. Moody. We all know who D.L. Moody is. And he asked, uh, he asked him if the story of Jonah and the whale, and he said it, he declared it was a myth. And then they started to question Moody. And Moody uh, responded with these four words. And it actually made quite a quite a scene, he says, I stand by Jonah. Stand by Jonah. He stands on the errant word of God, the infallible word of God. So what does this mean actually for us? How does the authority of scripture change, should change or operate in Clear Creek? It means this, we do not just preach from the New Testament. We just do not preach from the Old Testament. It means that we believe in the inerrancy of the scripture. We believe that all scripture is God breathed. It means that because God said it, that settles it. It means we get, go to the divine words of God to receive our answers. It means to receive our direction, to receive our vision from scripture. It means we prove, search, study the scripture with discipline, discernment, and dedication. And as a church, it's non-negotiable. We support it. And we stand on the inerrancy, infallible word of God, non-negotiable. Well, not only true that we cannot ignore the authority of Scripture, but Roman numeral number two, as I move on here, it is non-negotiable to ignore the administration of the ordinances. The administration of the ordinances. I so bad want to alliterate. I say administration of the sacraments, but we're not Catholic. So administration of the ordinances. Okay, that was supposed to be a little humor. There we go. So why would this point actually be required to be part of the church? Why would administration of the ordinances be non-negotiable to be a church? Is it a ritual that has to be done? If you look in Matthew 28, that's where I'm probably going to spring off to this again. If you look in Matthew 28, we know that familiar passage. Matthew 28, 28, 18, it says this. 
And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Jesus is addressing to his 11 disciples. This is after Christ's death. Jesus is giving his last little commandments, his last little speech, last-minute instructions before he ascends into heaven. And there in verse 18, look at what it says. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me. All authority in the Greek, exousia, meaning as something which is by his right. It was bestowed upon him by the one, being his father in heaven. In fact, all throughout Matthew, Matthew stressed the authority of Christ. Matthew 7, 29, for his teaching was for them as having one of authority. In Matthew 10, 1, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. That's just to name a few. So with all authority, with all power, Jesus makes an imperative to go and make disciples and baptize them. A direct command. An imperative. Now, I want you to hold your thought there for a minute. Okay? There's baptism. We see baptism is 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 set up in the grammatical form. Is set up in uh, in, in the sentence as a command. You can't argue with me. It's not an option. You need to go and do this. So there's there's the command. Now hold that thought and you flip over to Luke twenty two nineteen and we'll get our other little section here. Luke twenty two nineteen. Luke describes this account of Jesus instituting instituting the Lord's Supper. And makes a distinction that is specifically for Jesus' disciples. And there it says in Luke 22, 19, And when he, Jesus, had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them by saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, if we are to jog our memories, we know that the, the bread represents Christ's body. That was given sacrificially to his disciples. We know that. The disciples were to eat, eat it to symbolize their... Uh, to symbolize their faith in Christ and their, their reunion with him. And then the cup that Christ took was symbolizing the, uh, the ratification of the new covenant that was purchased by his blood. So if you were to turn over 1 Corinthians 11, and we know that passage really well, we'd read of Christ administrating this supper, and it says that I did it for you, you do it in remembrance of me, is what Jesus is saying. I did it for you, now you do it in remembrance of me. And this was to focus the disciples upon the person of Jesus Christ. Not just the benefits of his death, but the actual person of Jesus Christ. It is command to do this. You go and you baptize, you do this in remembrance of me. It's a command. You must obey. It's not an option for us. John G. Patton was a missionary to uh, New Hebrides. He described the first communion that he served there on his little island. He said it took him uh, nearly three hours. The islanders looked on with wonder and deathly silence. It was so new and strange to them. They were using this new communion that Someone had purchased and bought for them there in their silver little platters, so that added to it as well. John described, though, how he, he toiled and prayed for three long years to put the bread in the cup and the hands of these once stained hands from blood of cannibalism. And they now received and partake of the emblem and the seal of the Redeemer's love. That was happening for them. And he says this, and I quote, I had a foretaste of the joy of glory that well nigh broke my heart to pieces. I shall never taste a deeper bliss till I gaze on the glorified face of Jesus himself. And that was in October 24, 1869. So why was that service so special? Why did it grip him and move him to such a point? Well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a command is what it is. It is, a, it is command because these activities indicate what a church thinks about salvation. It is an outward expression of devotion to God. It is a reminder of who we are. 
church, we're redeemed, is what we are. We're redeemed. Remember, we're filled with, with, with sin. We're tainted with sin. And through the sacrificial blood on the cross, we have been redeemed. So Christ did it for us. We do it in remembrance for him. That's the only, that's the smallest thing that we can do, right? Just obey his command because we're redeemed. It's reminding, it's to show everyone around us, I am saved, I am blood-bought, I am redeemed. So as a body of believers, as a church, we administer these two ordinances, baptism and remembrance of the Lord's Supper. It's non-negotiable. Why is it important for our little church here? So it's important so we're just not gathering just as a little Bible club. It's important that we're not meeting just because of our ritual. It's important because we're, we're just checking it off our list. It's important because as we are declaring that we are saved, that we are redeemed, that we are blood-bought, we are digging deeper in our sanctification and showing the world who we are, children of God. That's why it's important. It's non-negotiable. That's the basics. <laughs> this morning, that's, that's the start of the anatomy of the church. They're the two that we're not going to debate about. And uh, there's going to be a lot more, of course, that we're, we're going to cover later on. But then this morning, we saw those two non-negotiables. A true church cannot ignore the authority of Scripture. We cannot ignore it. We will not ignore it. That's what we stand on. Secondly, a true church cannot ignore the administration of the ordinances. That's who we are. That's what we stand on. Jesus commanded it. He demonstrated it. He symbolized it. We do it. Jack Koscheck, I'm sure that's how he says his name, says in this book that he, he toured, um, while he was studying the Holy Land, he was there with a seminary professor, and uh, they ran to a man that said and claimed that he memorized the whole Old Testament in Hebrew. In Hebrew. And the professor was calling him out on that and says, I don't think you have. And the man said, yes, I have. So they met up a few days later and they sat down and the uh, seminary professor says, okay, start in Psalm 1. And the guy sat down and started reciting from memory. Two hours later, as the professor was still following along in his Hebrew Bible, and this guy had not missed a word, he was so stunned that he asked this guy, why in the world? How do you know? And as they started a dialogue, come to find out this man was an atheist. He was an atheist. He knew scriptures better than most Christians will ever know it. And yet he didn't believe. So what am I trying to say? Here's the application. If Clear Creek wants to see spiritual and numerical growth, if we're tired of being stagnant, then we need to know our Bible. We need to study our Bible. We need to build the foundation of the church upon the authority and errant word of God, and it becomes non-negotiable. That is where we start. That is where we get all of our answers from. That is where we get our vision from. That is what is going to monumentally cast us forward, starting there. Martin Luther says this, I study my Bible like I gather apples. First, I shake the whole tree that the ripest may fall. Then I shake each limb. And when I've shaken each limb, I shake each branch and every twig. Then I look under every leaf. I search the whole Bible like shaking the whole tree. I shake the whole limb, study book after book. I shake every branch, giving attention to the chapters. I shake every twig in careful study of the paragraphs, sentences, words, 
and definitions. We need to study by shaking the Bible, shaking the authority of Scripture, non-negotiable. And do you know what I've come to find out, church, through my little short time in ministry? The people who are most opinioned about the Bible are the ones who know the least about it. We need to be united as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as 1 Timothy says. We need to stand together as a household based upon the pillar, and that pillar is the authority of the truth, and the truth is the scriptures. We need to be brothers and sisters, a house that are passionately knowing the Bible. And how do we get to love it? actually getting into it. As Jeremiah comes forward and as we kind of focus our thoughts here on maybe upon our own little individual life, uh, maybe individually we are uh, maybe convicted in our soul that we can do a little bit better. We can all do better. We can all do better in our walk, in our sanctification, But maybe in our heart we start to purpose that I'm going to set apart this part of time or I'm going to make an effort to do this or I am going to try a piece of passage and put memory to it. I'm going to try and do something. I'm just going to start doing something is what I'm going to start doing. Maybe that's the conviction that we fall under and it's something that individually that we can do. But as we as we there and we change and we pray in our heart maybe it's starting to think a little bit broader here as the church is concerned at where we at at why aren't we moving forward is there maybe any sin hidden in the camp that we need to cleanse and get rid of so it does not affect the many bodies completing one singular sacrifice So as we, as we bow together this morning, as we think upon these things, if God is pulling to change, convict, draw near, I pray, Father, that uh, this is your invitation for those that maybe have not accepted you personally. All that we have talked about today is really the foundational truth of what they need to know that you sent your son to, to walk this life. He's fully God, fully man, a perfect son perfect man, perfect human, where blood was shed in the Old Testament for the remission of sin, blood was shed on the cross, and I pray, Father, that all they do is repent and believe, crying out for you, do they repent of their sins and believe, saying, I trust that you did all this for me. So as Christians, I I pray that uh, in our heart we can start making these changes to our lives, that if it pricks our minds, it pricks our souls, it makes us uncomfortable to the point where... It just draws us closer to you. Father God, I pray this is your invitation. I thank you, God, for all this in Jesus' name. I always want to let people know that the invitation is never over. It just doesn't stop here. Never. Some people might be a little timid about talking to me, but I pray that you email, that you text, that you give me a call, that you meet with me some other time, maybe discuss what is upon your heart, how God is 